All right, so we are live, everyone. So good morning or good late evening to our, our speaker joining us from halfway across the world today. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Sea of Your Pants. For those joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing uh, conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And we are particularly excited this February because, like we have done since we were founded, we kick out all the men and spend the entire month highlighting incredible women from around the globe. Over 45 sessions from, I think, 20 countries this month. So it's a crazy month. We really appreciate you joining us. And it's always our, our biggest tip with teachers. So thank you guys so much for, for joining in the celebration. We've got seven classes joining us from across North America and Europe today, which is really exciting. So I'm gonna give them a chance to say hi before we dive in with our speaker. So we've got Miss Weaver's class, grade six is joining us from Ocean City in New Jersey. Hi guys. Hi. Hey, <laughs> welcome in. We've got Miss Elliot's grade sevens joining us in Dallas, Texas. Hi guys. Hi. Hey, we've got Miss Powell's grade nines in Toronto, Ontario, where I am as well. Welcome in. Oh, yeah. Morning. Hello. I like the student who went, oh, yeah, thank you for that. That makes my morning. Uh, we've got Miss Sandoval's great fours, fives, and then another class joining in in Alkenbury Elementary in the UK. Welcome in. Let me just find your mic. There we are. Oh. Hey, guys. hey, wow, there's so many of you. I love it. <laughs> nice to have a UK class in again. It's been a while. We have Miss Maxwell's great sixes in DeWitt in Michigan. Hi, guys. Let's see if we can find you. Get Mike. Oh, they're there. They're there. Mike just cut out for a second. They're getting the stools off the table. Well, welcome in as you guys are pouring into class. Miss Aldridge's grade sixes in Morrison, Illinois. Hi, guys. Hi. Hey. And last but not least, we have Miss Gertzen's grade fours in Bueller in Kansas. I don't know if they're in yet. They're coming. Oh, they are in. They're in. Hi, guys in Kansas. Welcome in. Hi. And thank you for coming to school early. We appreciate it so much. All right. Of course, the reason you guys are all here today is for our speaker. So we are joined live in Siem Reap in Cambodia, literally 12 hours away. So it's nine in the morning here. It's nine at night there. Uh, we are thrilled to be joined by Alyssa Loyalis. So she is a Fulbright U.S. student program researcher. And this is a fun joint presentation because exploring by the seat of your pants, you guys know you've taken part in sessions before. Alyssa has also been involved with a group called Reach the World. So Reach the World does long form expedition tracking. They work with explorers to chart their expedition, bring in pictures, stories, videos, all sorts of stuff. So you can follow someone along for many months as they're in the field. We're gonna find out a little bit about how long Alyssa has been in the field during her presentation. But we really appreciate having her back for our Women in Science Month. And so she is a space archeologist. And what on earth is that? Well, straight from her bio, because she explained it better than I ever could, she uses pictures from satellites to find and map epic monuments and structures created by civilizations and people thousands of years ago. And then she gets to go to the site to learn about more about them directly. So if that isn't the coolest job in the world, I don't know what is. I'm gonna turn it over to Alyssa. Thank you so, so much for joining us today, all the way from Cambodia. And when we get your mic, de oh, let me demuted. You are good to go. Thank you so much and take it away. Awesome. Hey guys, thanks for joining me today. Um, sorry if my connection is bad. We just got a new internet router and apparently it doesn't work very well. Um, but, but like Jesse said, my name is Alyssa. I am a digital or space archaeologist living here in Cambodia for 10 months on a Fulbright grant and I'm currently on month five. Um, I did my undergraduate at Dartmouth College in Anthropology and my master's at the University of York in England. So welcome to the UK class. I I love the UK so much. Um, and I did my uh, master's there in digital archaeology, and now I'm here in Cambodia with the Fulbright program. And so I'd like to start off by asking, can anyone tell me what archaeology is? Sure. So let me take it to, you know what, Ms. Gertzen's class, I want to give you guys a chance to kick us off with that. Can you tell us what archaeology is? Okay, we have a volunteer running from the back. Running from the back. <laughs> You can shout it out to if you guys want. <laughs> okay, there. Something that discovers something ancient. Yeah, something okay. That discovers something ancient. Great definition. Okay, something ancient. How about Ms. Weaver's group? Love it. How about a couple more? Yeah, Ms. Weaver's group. That's definitely class. correct. What do you guys think? <laughs> what was the answer? Blackstage! <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's check in with one more group. It's Aldridge's class. What do you guys think? Archaeology. Jamie, go! Go! Jamie, Jamie. Um, 
a person who studies things from the past. Yeah. Yes, awesome. definitely. Awesome. So it sounds like you guys pretty much know what our archaeology is in general. Um, so archaeology is basically the study of people and the things that they leave behind. And so when we think of archaeological material, we typically think of things that are a thousand year old or even tens of thousands of years old. And the act of archaeology often involves excavation, which is digging in the ground to recover material in order to build a narrative about ancient cultures and the people who lived in these places. And the study of archaeology is important not only for the cultures that currently live in these places, but also for humanity as a whole so that we can understand how we got to where we are today. And so I'm going to share screens now and put up a couple of uh, pictures of famous archaeological sites to see if you know where they are and what they're called. We'll see how smart you guys are. No pressure at all. We didn't know there was going to be a quiz <laughs> today, but there is. There's a couple quizzes here today. Hmm? Okay, so can anyone tell me what the top left one is? Sure. So let's head to Miss Maxwell's class. You guys think? Oh, is the mic working? No, the mic isn't working with you guys. Okay, sorry about that. So I'm gonna, uh, we'll figure that out. We'll come back in a second. I'm gonna I'm go sure to Miss Elliot. Right yeah, Miss yeah, <laughs> Miss Elliot's group, top left. Right over there. Uh, it's the the Great Sphinx in in. He's up. Fantastic. Ooh. Yeah. Alyssa, are we doing the next one? Don't worry if it's not full screen. Yes. Is it zoomed in too much? It is zoomed in too much. We're missing the, the we're missing the other three now. <laughs> oh no. Oh. <laughs> oh now, now we're missing. We're, now we're even missing. See, the I'm story. a digital archaeologist, but I still don't understand how technology works. So Ironic. That's okay. With Zoom, we have to figure that? it out together. That's better. Okay. So the top right. How about we go to Miss Powell's group? Top right. You guys have any idea? They said Coliseum. Yep. Perfect. Okay. Bottom left. Let's go to the UK. You guys should know this. <laughs> okay. And then the <laughs> Bottom right, good job. <laughs> good job knowing what's nearby. Um, and then last but not least, let me go back to Ms. Aldridge's class. Do you guys know what the bottom right is? No. No, no idea. <laughs> okay, one more class, bottom right. Ms. Gertzen's class. What do you guys think, bottom right? Hmm. No takers, Alyssa, you'll have to tell us. Oh, no takers. So the bottom, bottom right is Anchor Watt. And that's right down the street from where I am today. And so one of the reasons why archaeology is so important in Cambodia right now is because it's not, not nearly as known as some of these other larger monuments. And this has a lot to do with the political history of the country and people not being allowed to do research here, um, which I'll talk a little bit about later. And so that's why you guys don't really know what this is. And I'm here to teach you what Angkor Wat is all about. And so I'm going to start off by going through how I ended up as an archaeologist and how I got to where I am today in Cambodia. And the reason why I'm going to go through all of this is because I think it's a little crazy how I ended up in this field in the first place, because it is definitely not what I expected, especially in middle school and high school. Um, and then I'll talk a bit about Cambodia and the archaeological research that I've done here with my team and then open the floor to any questions that you guys might have for me later. And so how I got into archaeology. So I went into college wanting to do astronomy. I always loved stargazing with my mom and dad outside. And then, but my school also encouraged that its students explore other topics and other departments in their first year. And so I took an anthropology class called The Rise and Fall of Prehistoric Civilizations because I thought it sounded really cool, but I had no idea what it was about. And so right after the first class, I was like, wow, this is so interesting. And so I went up to my professor and I told her that I was interested in the topic. And then she invited me to help her work on her research in her lab. And then after a couple months working with her, she invited me to Teotihuacan, Mexico with her and her research team. And so of course I said yes. And there I got to analyze figurines that were over 3,000 years old, climb the pyramid of the sun, which is in the top left uh, photo. I got to ride in a hot air balloon over the ancient city. 
and it was just such an awesome experience getting to work with these old artifacts. And here's actually an example of one of the figurines that we were working with. Uh, this is a model of a 3000 year old whistle that we had found. And I credit this object to be the reason why I became an archeologist is because when we first looked at this figurine, we didn't know it was a whistle because the hole in the back that you can see when it comes back around, it was packed full of dirt. So we thought it was just another crude little animal figurine, but someone on the team noticed that the hole was there and he cleaned it out. And then we were the first ones to blow on the whistle in 3000 years since it was left behind by the people who had made it. And being able to experience this, making a sound that hadn't been heard in so long and and see the fingerprints of the person who made it and dropped it on the ground 3,000 years ago. It was such an awesome feeling. And that was my first experience with archaeological fieldwork. And from then on, I was hooked on archaeology. And so after I got back from my research in Mexico, I met a professor who was doing digital archaeology. And so can anyone guess what digital archaeology is? Sure. Let me go to Algonbury uh, in the UK. Digital archaeology, what do you guys think? Yeah. Using satellites, okay. <laughs> A mass cacophony of ideas. Okay. Uh, do you want to go to another quick school? I can do that. Alyssa? Alyssa, you still there? Okay. Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, you cut out. Okay, so I heard a little bit and we talked about it a little bit before, so good job. Um, but archeology span as a science is inherently invasive. And so once you excavate a site, you can't put it back together. You dug it all up, it's not there anymore. And so when you excavate, you have to do it correctly the first time and record every little detail you find within the excavation. Digital archeology, span however, incorporates non-invasive techniques so that we can avoid digging as much as possible and keep archaeology in its context for future generations like you guys to study in the future. So technology is only getting better as we progress and so we want to try to learn as much as we can without destroying any of the history so that in the future we can do more in-depth studies on these places and these things. And so digital archaeology includes things like magnetometry where you can walk across the surface and send electric pulse into the ground and it tells you if something like a wall is underneath and then there's also what I do which is remote sensing techniques using satellite imagery and drone imagery and airborne laser scanning to find archaeological features and so airborne laser scanning is particularly cool because it removes the tree cover over a landscape and lets you see underneath all of the foliage and so here's an example on the slide these are pictures of the same area on the left is just normal Google satellite imagery and then on the right is the LIDAR imagery and you can see in the middle of that big mound of tree cover where you can't see anything underneath it with the LIDAR imagery it completely removes it so now you can see all of these little temple complexes underneath the tree canopy and so LIDAR is super useful especially in areas like Cambodia where it's largely covered in trees and so when I learned about this stuff I thought this was awesome because because you could learn so much about an ancient landscape that was so far away without even having to go there. And so how I got to Cambodia, after graduating from undergrad, I decided that I wanted to go back to school to get my master's degree. And at this point, I only knew that I wanted to do digital archaeology, but I didn't know where in the world I wanted to focus my studies. But then someone who went to my undergrad and graduated seven years before me added me on Instagram, and she had been doing some really cool digital archaeology in Cambodia. So I sent her a DM and asked her if we could talk on the phone because I wanted to hear more about what she was doing. And then at the end of that phone call, she asked me if I wanted to join her fieldwork in Cambodia. And so this is Sarah on the left, and then that's me. And then these are just some photos from uh, the first time I went to Cambodia, which was almost exactly a year ago today. And so before meeting Sarah, I barely knew where Cambodia was on a map. I had never studied any of the archaeology there. And now it's my life. And so that's all because of an Instagram 
message and I'm really grateful for that follow that day. And so um, that's how I ended up in Cambodia and I visited Cambodia for the first time last year and then received the Fulbright to spend 10 months here doing research. And so I'm currently in my fifth month. Uh, to give some perspective, this is a map of the world. The US is all the way to the left and then Cambodia is almost all the way to the right. And it takes about 22 hours of flying to get from my home in California all the way to Cambodia. From the UK, which is where I came from last time, it took about 15 hours of traveling. So it's pretty far away from the Western world where you guys are located. Um, Cambodia is known for its big monuments like Angkor Wat and Koh Kher, where films like Angelina Jolie's Tomb Raider was filmed. Um, Cambodia was largely inaccessible to the rest of the world up until a couple decades ago because of a civil war called the Khmer Rouge. During this period, a lot of these ancient temples were destroyed, along with a lot of the people who researched them as well. And so a lot of the last couple decades have just been dedicated to rebuilding all of these ancient structures and really getting to study them. And so while research and new technologies were being used in other parts of the world to study history, very little was being done in Cambodia during this period. And so that's one of the reasons why re this research is important, not only to bring awareness to the culture, to the world, but also to the Cambodian population that have lost so much already. And so my research specifically this year is focused on Koh Kher, which is a temple complex about two hours northeast from where I am now in Siem Reap, which is where Angkor Wat is. Um, here's a picture of Koh Kher. Koh Kher was once an ancient capital of Cambodia and at its center is a seven tiered step pyramid that's about 35 meters tall. And within the temple complex, there have been about 96 temples found, many of which are in rubble or no longer standing. And one of my goals for research at Koh Kher was to document some of these, which I'll talk about more in a minute. But to just show how big this temple is, is on the right side of the picture, you can see a staircase, which lets tourists climb all the way to the top of the temple. And I actually submitted my PhD application from the top of the temple because I got the best search service up there. So yeah. <laughs> um, so the team I'm working with brings together researchers from all over the world, including Cambodia, Australia, Canada, Brazil, France, and the United States, which is me. Uh, most of our research here is in digital archaeology using non-invasive methods for conducting archaeological research. And this means that instead of excavating and digging into the ground, we're using satellite imagery to map all of the archaeology. We can see in the satellite imagery, go to the ground and um, do ground penetrating radar to see if we can see anything else like palace walls beneath the surface. And then we use drone survey to document the temples and then 3D models to digitally preserve the archaeology. And so I'm going to show a quick minute and a half long video of some of the footage we took on site for 3D modeling. And while you're watching this, I want you to think of some reasons why we would want to document and make 3D models of these temples. Um, I'm actually going to go to YouTube really quick because I know that it's not, not going to work <laughs> when I click on that. So one second. <laughs> but yeah, think of reasons why uh, we would want to document and make 3D models in the first place of archaeology. And then I'll come back to you in a second. How's the connection so far? It's pretty good. You, you, there's like it cuts out occasionally, but we always hear everything you're saying. We never miss anything. It just takes a second for it to come through. <laughs> Great. Okay. While you're getting this up too, I'll just mention to our classes that we've done a bunch of sessions with Reach the World speakers this year. We're, we're continuing to do the mosaic expedition currently in the Arctic, but between that and snow leopards in China, um, leeches in Madagascar and more, it's been really, really exciting, highlighting some fantastic women uh, in the field from around the world. So if you guys want to check out some of those sessions too, uh, when we're done, I'll, I'll pass them along. Great. Okay, so here's some uh, drone image footage that we took uh, during this field work. Fantastic. These are some of the main temples that we visited. Uh, these are the ones that are in the best shape aside from the big seven-tiered temple. 
This one's called The Black Lady, very beautiful. So we use the drone imagery to get some of the angles that we wouldn't be able to get on the ground. And so all of the top view is really useful for making 3D models because those are places that we can't see just from uh, standing on the ground. It's Prasat Lek Nang. Prasat Chen. This one's a smaller temple called Linga Four. And then the final temple, which is for Sakbok Mok. And yeah. So can anyone tell me reasons why we would want to document and make 3D models of these temples? Absolutely. So let's go to Ms. Weaver's class. Do you guys have any ideas? So you can see it from all sides without breaking or touching it? Perfect. So you can see it from all sides without breaking or touching it? That was a really good answer. <laughs> Alyssa, do you want me to check in with another class or Great does that cover it? Yeah. <laughs> That's really good. Alyssa, did you want me to check in with one more class or not? He's not hearing me, but that's okay. Good to go. Ooh. Yep, good to go. If you want to take okay. it back. So yeah, that was a great answer. There. Um, a lot of this has to do with giving access to people who can't come see them in person. And this includes researchers. So if a model is done well enough, you can do things like measure each individual block or zoom into the detail of the carvings on the pillars and doorways and use the model to compare it to other temples around the world. Another reason is for preservation. While these temples have been standing for a thousand years or so, that doesn't mean that they'll be around forever. Um, and this is because things like war or erosion or tourists coming in and climbing and touching things and just time in general affect the preservation of these sites. So digitally preserving them allows for future generations to study them even when they're no longer here. And another reason is for education. These sites aren't the easiest to get to, even for the Cambodians who live here. And many people have never seen them before. For example, it took me two hours by a private truck to be able to get to these sites. And there aren't really any major buses or anything that go to Coquare in specific. And so making them digitally available brings awareness to their existence and can feel excitement and curiosity for for their history. And so I'm going to show you really quickly just the process of making one of these models. Uh, the first thing we do is we take hundreds of pictures. And this is by phone camera, by DSLR camera, by drone imagery, and we put them all into one folder. And then we put them into a, a 3D modeling software. So this one in particular is uh, Metashape. And all of the blue squares represent Present a picture that was taken. And so the ones that are up high are from the drone imagery, imagery. the ones from down below are from uh, just on foot with the camera. And then when you remove those images, you get a sparse point cloud, which gives you a general shape of the model that you're making. And then from, from there, you build a dense point cloud where you can see more detail of the model. And then after that, you clean up and take away all the stuff that you don't really want in the model. And then you create the texture and you have a nice model of a temple. And this one was a really quick render. This one only took like maybe an hour or so, but really good renders will take sometimes days to be able to do like the highest detail for a model. And so modeling is very awesome. <laughs> and I love it a lot. And so uh, what am I doing now? That field work was done in December. And what we're doing now is kind of sorting through that data. Um, what I'm working on in particular is looking for any temples that may not have been recorded in the original survey with just regular Google satellite imagery. And I'm doing this um, by looking for anything that looks interesting and then marking it on Google Earth and then putting it into our database. And then later it's a temple or what we think it is. And so here's a screenshot of Google Earth and here's one of the temples that we already have recorded. 
constructed. And you can tell that it's a temple because of the man-made square shape and then the walled boundaries around it and the horseshoe shaped moat around the central temple. And so I wanna show you guys Google Earth, if it will let me, just to show you what this process kind of looks like. How does that look? Yeah, so we can see Google Earth, it's great. Okay, great. So here's Cambodia. This is all of the data we have, which are all a bunch of temples. And so when I zoom in to Cambodia, you can see all of the different dots and each one of that do those dots represent temples that have already been recorded around Cambodia. And so, for example, the one that I just showed you in the uh, slides, let's try to zoom into it. Oh. So very slowly. And there it is. And so the process of finding these temples is zooming out a bit, just scrolling around, seeing if you can find anything that looks like a temple, and then placing a mark on it. And what I'm doing for Cambodia specifically specifically is focusing on the two provinces that we'll be doing research in, which are Battambang and Prayavihir province, which is where Kokhair is. So I'm going to switch back to this now. Fantastic. We've got about four more minutes if you want, uh, and then we're going to dive in with questions, if that's okay with you too, Alyssa. Great. Okay, I'm almost done. <laughs> then, so what's next for me? We have field work planned in April back at Co-care to look at some of these new temple sites and then also fieldwork in Battenbong, which I've never been before. So I'm very excited to be able to do that. Um, also, when my time is done with this grant in July, I'll start my PhD at Stanford, which I just found out about three days ago and I'm super excited about. And so I'll be coming back here every year to continue fieldwork and doing dissertation research. And I'm super excited about that. And just in case you guys are interested, some ways to get involved in archaeology now. Um, there's always archaeological lectures at museums and universities, especially in the UK. There's so much archaeology being done in the UK. It's incredible. Um, there's also archaeology camps for kids and adults offered in the summer, usually at local museums. At high school and college ages, many people interested in archaeology also sign up for field schools across the world. For example, this is a photo of a field school I went to in Washington State, where we excavated a a Japanese settlement from the late 1800s that was abandoned. And then there are equally important topics that also involve archaeology, including anthropology, archaeology, history, classics, Asian studies, etc. And the most important thing to do is networking. And this goes for archaeology, not only archaeology, but for anything you may be interested in doing as a career. If there's something that you really love doing, find someone else that's already doing it or something similar and ask them for help and advice. And this all almost always can lead to new opportunities to find a career that you're proud of and enjoy. And so in conclusion, archaeology is an important field of study because it allows us to know about where we came from, where our ancestors' lives may have been like, and how we got to where we are today. And we are nothing without our history, and that's why we must do our best to uncover, record, and preserve it to the best of our ability. And so that's me and my research, and if you guys have any questions, Fantastic. Yeah. Well, thank you so, so much, Alyssa. That was marvelous as, as always. And uh, thanks for dealing with the tech issues with the Uh yeah. And congrats on the PhD. That's so exciting. Good for you. For our, our younger students, you won't know how significant that is, but it's a really exciting thing. And, and, and kudos to you, Alyssa. Uh, I hope it, it goes really, really well in the next coming years. Um, in addition to our live classes, we've got over 10 groups watching on YouTube live. So if you guys want to type in questions, let me know where you're joining from, what grade you are. I'd be happy to pass along as many questions as we can. But let us start by going to Ms. Weaver's class. If you guys want to kick us off with a question on archaeology, space archaeology, Cambodia, and more, uh, come on up and take us away. Hopefully I can hear it. <laughs> okay. What other ancient cultures are you interested in studying? Ooh. So, Alyssa, what other ancient cultures Great. are you interested in studying? Yeah. Awesome. Um, so, I started off my archaeological journey really interested in Mesoamerica. And I think that's such a great uh, place to be studying, too, because they also have these amazing ancient temples 
temples and very old history back to 3000 years ago. And after that, I started working um, on research that was involved in, in Syria and Iraq. And I thought that was where I was going to work after that, because I thought that was so cool. I spent a lot of my time in college tracking where looting was happening across Syria and Iraq using satellite imagery. And um, that was just like an awesome experience, too. And I thought I was going to apply I, uh, to grad school to do Middle Eastern archaeology. But then Cambodia popped up out of nowhere. And I really love Cambodia history. And I also have have ties with Japanese heritage. I'm a quarter Japanese. And so Japanese history is something I'm really interested in as well. And I'm beginning to learn Japanese to be able to create those networking opportunities with Japanese archaeologists who are also working in Cambodia. And so hopefully I'll be able to make some connections there as well. As, get some Japanese archaeology under my belt in the future. As Danny, I'm sure you will. How very cool. And uh, great question to kick us off, guys. All right, let's head to Texas. Uh, if Ms. Elliott's class wants to come up, go for it. Um, when working on the field, what tools or what equipment am I choosing to use? Oh, you guys cut out a little bit there. We got the first little bit of that. You're working on something. Sorry. When working on the field, what equipment am I choosing to use? Alyssa, I don't know if you're catching that. Sorry, guys. Like, I don't know what. <laughs> like, we heard the first minute of it and then nothing of the rest. <laughs> No, so come to the middle of the camera. Come straight in front of the camera. It's like when you move to the side, it, ex it kills it. There you go. Um, when working in the field, what equipment, like tools and food, do you have to pack daily? Perfect. Thanks, guys. Can you repeat that? Yeah, so when you're working in the field, what kinds of tools and equipment do you use to do all the work that you're doing? Sorry, one more time. Oh, Alyssa, <laughs> so when you're in the field, what kind of tools and equipment are you using? Okay, great. Um, so when I'm in the field here, we're mostly doing digital archaeology. So this involves like a massive ground penetrating radar thing, which is basically just a big metal wagon that you drag across the ground. And that basically gives you a reading of what's beneath the surface. surface. And so we've been able to find like palace walls that we weren't like you can't see from the top of the ground. and we're starting to build like an image of what the surrounding buildings around the major temple look like because of this technology. And so uh, uh, we don't do a whole lot of excavation in Cambodia and we try not to do that. We want it to be mostly digital archeology span so that we're not ruining any of the archeological context. And so that's the main tool that we use. Other than that, we use uh, drones, we use cameras, we use satellite imagery. There really isn't a whole lot of hands-on tools that we, we use brooms to sweep the jungle, literally sweep the jungle. <laughs> Whenever we find a laterite block, we'll use a broom to sweep it off and then take a picture of it. And so we do a lot of sweeping. <laughs> All the highest tech tools and then the humble broom, fantastic. Um, Alyssa, uh, let me pass along a question from Miss Powell's class. So you guys wanna come up in Toronto, go for it. What's the coolest and most valuable thing you found in your studies? Ooh. So Alyssa, what's the coolest, most valuable thing you found in your studies? You're cutting out a little bit, but I think you asked what's the coolest thing. And most valuable. Coolest, most valuable thing in your studies. Um, say that again. What was the last question? <laughs> yeah, Alyssa, what's the coolest, most valuable thing you have found in your studies? I will type it into you and then you can get that <laughs> I way. Think, I think I know. Okay. Um, one of the coolest things I've found um, was when I worked at my field school in Washington working on the Japanese site. Um, Basically what happened is when that site was abandoned, no one else lived there since it was abandoned. So everything that those people had was just laying on the surface. And so this included really beautiful blue and white porcelain plates, whole like bed frames, whole drainage systems, coins and that sort of thing. And there's this beautiful plate that I found that was, it was white with blue 
porcelain and like a gold lining around it. And I was tasked with the task of drawing it and replicating the image. And I just think it was so beautiful. And that was, was kind of one of my favorite things, along with also the figurine that I talked about earlier. I thought that experience was really cool as well. Fantastic. All right. I'm going to go to Miss Sandoval's class. Uh, let's go to the UK. If you guys have a question, come on up. So, what is one of your biggest finds in your archaeology career? Yeah. I will type that into you, Eliza, just in case. So, I think I would reiterate the figurine. Um, just the figurine in general, the whistle was yeah. probably one of the biggest finds because that site in particular was older than the ancient Aztecs. It was before people really started settling down and building up. And so everything that these people had was stuff that they could carry with them. And we hadn't found any trace of musical instruments before that whistle. And so that was the first piece of music that we were able to find in the civilization that predated all of these massive structures. And so that was a really cool find. And I, I cherish that find in my heart. So. Fantastic. Um, so I'm going to go to Miss Maxwell's class in a second. I know you guys had some mic difficulties earlier. So if you want to type in your question now, and then just in case the mic doesn't work, I'll have it. Uh, but in the meantime, Alyssa, I wanted to pass along a question from uh, uh, Summer Boys in Queen Elizabeth School in Ontario. And she wanted to ask, how old were you when you started studying archaeology? I was... 20-ish. Um, I, I didn't start archaeology until well into my college career. Like I said before, um, I thought I wanted to do astronomy and then I realized that I didn't really like math <laughs> and astronomy involves a lot of math. And so I started shopping around for other things. I had always loved history growing up. Um, history was always my favorite class in high school. And then and so I just started shopping around like the history department and the classics department and then found anthropology. And I just stuck with that class from then on and it kept snowballing into this awesome experience that I get to call my career now. And I haven't stopped since. And I signed up for five more years of a PhD in it. So mm -hmm. looks like it's staying. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, so I'm gonna check in with this Maxwell's group. And then if not, they have typed in their questions. Let's see if we got your mic working. Okay, Into it. Hi. Hey, yeah, it works. <laughs> hey, we did it. <laughs> if you could, would you go to the West to do archaeology? Yeah. Can you repeat, please? Yep. So, Alyssa, if you could, would you go to the Western world to do archaeology? North, South America, Europe, any of those above? I didn't hear the first part. Oh, uh, would you go to the West? Would you go west to North or South America, Europe, Western world for archaeology? I'll type it in. <laughs> there. I'm sorry, the internet. That's so okay, no worries. I just typed it in. Would you go to the Western world to study? So all of my studying at universities has been in the Western world. And so I went to college in New Hampshire, and then I went to grad school in the UK. Um, so while I was in the UK, I got to study a lot of UK history and Roman architecture. And you guys know how lucky you are to have all of those massive churches in your cities. And so York in particular is one of the best places to study archaeology in the UK because it's one of the only cities that still has its ancient medieval wall surrounding it. And so I was very fortunate to be able to do study there. Um, I think from now on, I'm going to be sticking to Cambodia as a career path and just what I'm focused in. When you get to my stage in the career, you kind of pick one thing you want to stick with. And so up until this point, I've kind of been like trying out different um, fields of study in archaeology, but I think at this point I'm sticking with Cambodia and that's probably where I'll stay for a long time, or at least Southeast Asia. So I'll jump into Thailand and in India and that sort of thing as well. Yeah, well, it's a beautiful spot in the world and, and you've certainly shown us that, so it's a good pick. 
Um, all right, we're going to take a few more questions. Ms. Aldrich's class, I know you typed it in, but let's see if we got your mic working and you can come up and say it in person. Have you found any common patterns in the structure of the temples you have discovered? Ooh. So Alyssa, if you didn't catch that, it is typed in already, um, but have you found any common patterns in the structures of the temples you've discovered? Yes. So one really cool thing about all of the temples that were built during the Khmer Empire when Angkor Wat was the major capital is all of the temples face Angkor Wat. And that shows respect for the capital as the capital. And that's something that's really cool. And all of these temples built in this period generally uh, share the same pattern with the horseshoe shaped moat, um, same different surrounding temples around it too. And what we also find is that Cambodia takes a lot of influence from Indian archaeology as well. And so the Khmer Empire, when it was at its height, was all over Southeast Asia. It wasn't just constricted to the modern borders of Cambodia. And so we're continuously uh, finding more and more just across all of Southeast Asia as we uh, start to collaborate with archaeologists in other countries as well. Yeah, awesome. Uh, that's a great segue into a question from a YouTube class. So we'll take one more from YouTube, one more from live. Um, but in uh, Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, uh, from Caldwell Road Elementary, they wanted to ask how many other temples have been found in this way? So you, you showed us this imagery of finding temples via satellite. How many other places have we found because of this? Oh gosh, so many. I can't even begin, like you saw the Google satellite imagery, just how many dots are on there. And that's not even all of them. There's still so many more that we haven't put into the database. I think at this point, we know that there are temples and most of the local cultures know that they're there. So there's not really like discovering temples anymore, but it's being able to put all of this <coughs> into one coherent database to where we can visualize it on a screen. And we're still missing a lot of data from that. And so that's the goal now is to get everything into one place so that we can start making the these comparative analysis between different cultures and spaces in Cambodia. Super cool. All right. We're going to wrap up by going to our early arrival class, Ms. Gertzen's in Kansas. If you guys want to wrap us up, come on up. Has anything you found went to the museum? Ah, has anything you found gone to the museum or, or museums in general, Alyssa? <laughs> See if she can hear that. Alyssa? Um, yes, yeah. I think so. Um, hi. <laughs> so um, on my dig in Altica and Teotihuacan, Mexico, for example, we did a study of a bunch of figurines that came from this period. And now all of those figurines are being held at a research center. And the really nice ones go into local museums. And so I assume yes, but I have not gone to visit any museums that have objects that I've held. Oh. <laughs> so. Well, we hope you do one day, but that would be super cool. Um, Alyssa, before we wrap up, I know we have many more questions on YouTube. I know we can go back to all the classes, but we're running out of time. So where can we guide kids to learn more about you and your work and to uh, get more excited about space archaeology in general? Yes. So throughout this process, I've been making YouTube videos of my fieldwork. Um, on YouTube, I have a page. It's just lists archaeology. Um, and if you search Cambodia, you could probably find it. And then also, I have an archaeology Instagram page, which is um, aal.archaeology, which are my initials. I think that's it. But that's where I've been um, kind of updating this whole process of being in Cambodia. And that's where I continue or plan to continue um, updating everything throughout grad school and continued research. So you can find me on Instagram and YouTube if you would like to. Fantastic. We'll also pass along all your Reach the World uh, stories that you've shared over the last few months. 
Um, and we, we really appreciate you joining us today. Alyssa, I know you've done one with us before, uh, but as you know, uh, what we do at the end of every session is I'm gonna demute every class's microphone. And so boys and girls, if you guys could get ready to join me in saying a huge thank you to Alyssa for joining us from 12 hours away. Uh, you are all now demuted and go for it. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> awesome guys thank you guys so much for joining today again uh, all month long we are showcasing incredible women from around the globe uh, Alyssa might be our absolute furthest but uh you can check out for many more over the next coming weeks as well Alyssa we really appreciate you being here thank you so so much for joining us my pleasure all have right a great have a day everyone